and welcome to this All Tech is Human live stream. I'm Rebecca Tweed. I'm the executive director at All Tech is Human. And in today's live stream, I'm going to be in conversation with Hilke Shellman. Hilke is the author of the new book, The Algorithm, How AI Decides Who Gets Hired, Monitored, Promoted, and Fired, and Why We Need to Fight Back Now. So if you're joining live, um, go ahead and say hi in the comments and let us know where you're tuning in from and what questions you might have for Hilke. Uh, we'll try to get to as many of those as we can at the end of our time together. And for those who are new to our community, welcome. Um, All Tech is Human is a nonprofit. We're based in Manhattan and we have a global lens and reach that spans over 80 countries. The organization was founded in 2018 by David Ryan Polgar, uh, and we are committed to building and strengthening the responsible technology ecosystem so that we can tackle complex tech and society issues uh, in order to co-create a tech future that's aligned with the public interest. Um, so we provide opportunities for deeper engagement with this ecosystem through a few different work streams. So we have multi-stakeholder convenings and community building. Um, and we have in-person events. So in 2023, we held 23 in-person events. And this next year, we have quite a few as well. We also build community through our Slack group. So we have almost 8,000 people from across the globe. If you haven't already, please go ahead and join us on Slack. You can find that uh, at alltechishuman.org, information on how to apply. Uh, so we provide a deeper understanding of the responsible tech ecosystem also through our multidisciplinary education work stream. So we convene open working groups that gather a couple hundred people across the globe to collaborate on reports on social uh, issues like AI and human rights or tech and democracy, improving social media or the business case for AI ethics. And then of course we have our flagship resource, the Responsible Tech Guide. Uh, and through that, we, uh, we revise that every September. We focus on six key subject matter areas and we provide resources in these uh, areas, um, those are responsible AI, trust and safety, uh, public interest technology, tech policy, cyber and democracy, and youth tech and well being. And then finally, we, provi we provide career development opportunities in this space. Um, so we do a lot of work to diversify the traditional tech pipeline with more backgrounds disciplines, perspectives, lived experiences. And then we also try to build that responsible technology talent pipeline. Um, so to that end, we have a responsible tech job board, a responsible tech talent pool and talent matchmaking service. In addition to a social impact matchmaking platform called Techalo, uh, where we connect technologists with meaningful roles in the nonprofit and government sectors, uh, working on social impact causes, uh, we also have a Responsible Tech University Network, a Responsible Tech Mentorship Program. We just closed out applications for our fifth cohort. We had a thousand applications for that and our first four cohorts of the Responsible Tech Mentorship Program. We've already had a thousand people go through it. Um, so if any of that sounds interesting to you, please check us out on uh, alltechishuman.org, uh, which we have recently updated. So if you have not been there um, in the last few weeks, please check it out. It's been completely overhauled. All right, so I am thrilled today to be joined by Hilke Shellman. Uh, we'll go ahead and bring Hilke up on screen while I introduce her. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Hilke is an Emmy award-winning investigative reporter uh, and journalism professor at NYU. Uh, her work covering artificial intelligence has been published in the New York Times, The Guardian, MIT Technology Review and the Wall Street Journal, where she led a team investigating how AI is changing our lives. All right, so welcome, Hilke. Go ahead and bring you up on screen. Oh, there I am. Hey. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Welcome. Nice to see you. And thank you, everyone, for for joining us. Uh, you know, I see that people are here from like all kinds of different states in the U.S., from Europe and other places. That's wonderful. Thank you for for spending time with us. Yes, welcome everyone. Um, so we have a lot to cover today. So we'll go ahead and jump right in so we can um, try to get to some audience questions as well. So at All Tech is Human, we really like to find out um, how people came to the responsible tech space. Uh, so really interested in learning a little more about uh, your background and specifically how you came to be interested in uh, the use of AI in hiring and other HR functions. Yeah. And then ultimately, like what brought you to writing this incredible book? 
Yeah. So, I mean, the funny thing is, I think in this case, um, AI kind of found me or the people who use this tool did, did find me because I was just a reporter and I, you know, I had reported on like, uh, you know, the problems with like sexual assault in Pakistan and, and other places. And, and I've never really looked at tech, but I was at a conference um, in Washington, D.C. in late 2017. It was with, filled with lawyers. No one knew about anything about AI at the time, certainly not these lawyers. And I needed a ride from the, from the conference um, uh, back to the, to the train station to, to go back to New York. And I, you know, called myself a lift and I just chatted with the driver and I was like, how was your day? And, and he was like, oh, I had a really strange day. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm a reporter. I'm like, oh yeah, tell me more. Um, so, you know, he was kind enough to share, he probably was like, whoa, this lady is intense in the backseat. Um, but, you know, he shared with me that he had a, um, he called it a job interview with a robot. He had applied to a baggage handler position at a local airport and he got a call from quote unquote robot asking him three questions. And I was like, wow, job interviews by a robot. You know, I made a note and sort of forgot about it until I went to an AI conference uh, uh, a couple months later where somebody who had just left the EOC gave gave a talk and there weren't many people. And she said, you know, she can't sleep at night because they're basic algorithmic tools that go through people's emails and, and check attendance via calendars. And she's afraid this might harm uh, uh, folks who are have a lot of absences, which is often people with disabilities, mothers in the United States or people who have caregiving responsibilities. She was really worried. And she told me about a company, HireVue, that does facial expression analysis uh, and international voice analysis to figure out if somebody, um, is going to be a successful employee. And I was like, that sounds like magic. Sounds very interesting. I'm going to call people up. So I started reporting on this. And as my body of work, I mean, my, I, you know, my body of work grew, my fascination grew of the topic, right? That I'm like, how are we quantifying human beings? And does this actually work? Does this work that we, you know, when I first saw the first demonstration of like the uh, facial points and what they, you know, with the computer and first, I was like, wow, is this magic or what is this? Because it seemed so convincing what the companies put up there. And I was like, wow, we found a solution to hiring because we know human hiring is not really good. Like humans are very hiring, uh, very biased in hiring. Uh, so as like the work grew, my fascination grew. And, you know, I went to these tech conferences and there was like 10,000 people at HR Tech, hundreds of um, startups and, and, and bigger companies and vendors that, uh, you know, they all have AI built in. And I was like, wow, this is like sweeping um, the, the business world. But I don't think that people know about this. And we need more knowledge. We need to know how prevalent this is and, and what works and what doesn't work. So that all came together for me to, to, to write this book. Yeah, um, that's fascinating. And, and so I'd love it if you could talk a little bit about, uh, you know, you mentioned some of these tools, but can you give us a sense of like, yeah. Mm -hmm. What tools are they and where are they used throughout the uh, the different HR business processes? Like what what are the tools and, and where are they used? Yeah, so we see um, like probably AI is most prevalent in hiring um, because you have companies that get a high volume of applicants, right? And especially starting with, uh, you know, with the advent of job platforms, right? So we have like LinkedIn and Monster and when they all started, you know, sort of this idea like well, they will democratize hiring. Everyone can send easily their uh, resume to to all these companies and on the other side what happened is like companies just got flooded with resumes and they felt like well we need a technological uh, solution here right we need some technology to help us like google gets about three million or so applications a year there's no way a human or even a team of humans can physically go through that right um so they needed a technological uh, 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 uh solution so we see it in resume screeners um, and anyone, and I don't know if everyone knows that, but if you upload your um, CV to any of the job, job platforms, they all use some form of LinkedIn. I don't know exactly, uh, sorry, they use some form of AI. Uh, I don't know exactly what they use, uh, but they all told me that they did. Uh, so we see that in resume screenings and a lot of um, large companies also have applicant tracking systems, how they uh, you know track folks going through the quote unquote hiring pipeline. All of those uh, large vendors now have AI built in there too, but I don't know what a company turned on and off, right? No, none of us know that. Um, there's no regulatory requirement. So we see um, uh, AI being used there. And then it's often used in one way video interviews. I don't, you know, all my students often know HireVue, which is one of the dominant vendors where you get sort of pre-recorded questions on your phone or on your desktop, you answer them. And uh, sometimes a human hiring manager watches that. And sometimes we see AI tools uh, inferring 
how likely you are to be successful in the job based on your, your job interview. Uh, we've seen a whole lot of AI games. Um, and especially if you are applying in the banking or investment banking industries, uh, you will likely uh, get like either uh, one-way video interview screens or AI games. Like it's almost impossible to get an entry-level position in those business functions without an AI screen. Uh, and then sometimes we see it for like social media background checks of um, uh, of, of folks who, who are applying, but also of, of existing em employees. It's called continuous background checks um, to check on like, you know, what kind of sentiments do you have in your, uh, 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 in, in, in your tweets possibly or on LinkedIn and, how are, how are you changing? And they, the companies can make inferences uh, uh, from from that. Um, and so, and we know that like 99%, at least 99%, probably 100% by now, of Fortune 500 companies use AI somewhere in the hiring pipeline. It's pretty widespread, especially for very large companies and medium-sized companies. Um, and then we see AI tools being used um, to monitor and survey employees. Um, and I think that got really a push during the pandemic. A lot of these tools existed, but you know, a lot of uh, you know managers were worried, like, do the people that I employ actually work? What do they do all day? And so they started um, uh, pushing and using like keystroke and analysis, like every keystroke that you put on your keyboard, that you press on your keyboard. Um, you can check uh, which URL you use on your computer, what programs you use. You can, you know, people, uh, companies use that to infer productivity. Are you on productive websites, unproductive websites? Um, they can they can check like how much you print any uh, uh, any device you connect to your computer. So those are often inferences for flight risk. Do you update your LinkedIn a lot? Do you move files around to your private Google Drive? Do you print out a large amount of uh, things? Those can all be signals to infer, or oh, somebody's at flight risk, or is an insider threat? That's another thing that companies now use. Um, they can check what sentiment um, uh, workers use in their emails. Like, are you, you know, they make sort of inference. Are you bully? Are you, at, uh, uh, do, you uh, do you bring um, on toxic workplace culture? It's also used in like, a lot of like call centers, you know, when you know, when you call a call center and they say like, oh, you know, um, uh, uh, your uh, the call might be recorded for quality uh, purposes. So it will be often there is a live tracking and will tell call center employees like, oh, use more empathy. Uh, there's a cue, use more empathy, speak less quickly, uh, sell this. Um, so there's like a live tracking um, of these calls. So we see this. Um, in very many industries. And um, the New York Times um, found out that eight of the 10 largest companies in the US monitor their employees. Um, so we know this is used, but we don't have official figures because companies don't need to tell their employees in the United States. Um, and they don't have to tell any regulatory body. Um, so we don't actually know exactly how large the scope is. Um, but we know it's there. And now we also see some signals being used in firing decisions. Like, are you under your productivity level? Um, you know, we see this a lot for folks in warehouses and, and drivers, delivery drivers, because everything is tracked via GPS. Uh, you know, if you're not successful delivering the packages, if you fall under your productivity guidelines for a certain amount, uh, you might get terminated based on those signals. Yeah, I have so many questions already. I'm sure a lot of other people do too. So if you're watching this live, please go ahead and um, add a question oh, in please the do, chat. Yeah, I'd yeah, love to hear what your questions are. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, especially with regards to the hiring decisions, what, what are the things that these tools claim to be able to uh, ascertain mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. a candidate? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. um, for instance, like, what are they supposed to be learning about a candidate from just their vocal biomarkers or uh, their facial yeah. expressions? Yeah, many, many, many things, apparently. Uh, <laughs> um, so what we see is like these, um, these tools, and you know, I mean, I, so, I sort of get it from an HR perspective, right? You want to look under the hood and know who the person really is. Um, so, you know, we, 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 um, some companies use these tools to sort of uh, understand like what are your emotions that are based on your facial expressions that you exhibit on your face. Um, then uh, we see like sort of personality traits and how you play an AI game uh, is, is something the AI tools are supposed to infer. So so the, so what a lot of the startups and the, and the vendors say is like, oh, you're gonna democratize hiring because AI treats everyone the same. It, you know, if somebody who uh, interviews you is hungry, they will see you in a different light than when they're happy. Uh, humans are very bad. A computer sees you all the way. Everyone will get the same chance. 
Um, so that's one way that they um, uh, uh, market the technology. They also say there's been less bias because humans are very biased. And it's very true. Humans are very biased. Um, so we don't make good hiring decisions either. So, so the tools will supersede us. And then they also claim that this will um, be, be very efficient and, and save a lot of costs. And I think that is really true. Like these tools actually make hiring much more faster and more efficient. Uh, the companies save a lot of money. And I think that's so that's why they often like these tools because they speed up the process. We haven't found a whole lot of evidence that there's less bias in these tools and that these tools actually pick the most qualified candidates. Uh, because it turns out if you look at facial expressions in job interviews and compare that to uh, facial expressions that people had in job interviews previously, there isn't a whole lot of evidence that this actually works. We don't have any science that says you need to have certain facial expressions to be successful in the job. Certainly not in job interviews, but even on the job, right? Like we, this is not, there's actually no science there. So we're just making correlations that like if this person A was now successful had the, smiled when they answered this question and an and a, a applicant smiles the same way at the same time, then that's an inference that, 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 that this person might be successful. Uh, so a whole lot of is not based on actual science. Um, and the same is often with we see with AI games, because a lot of people who are currently in the job play the games and whatever, you know, then they compare it to the general population, whatever their outstanding traits are, that's what you look for in applicants playing the games. Um, so maybe all of your accountants that you have are, um, are risk takers in, in games. Um, so then you look at applicants, other risk takers too. But there's a question, you know, I played some of these games and you pump up the balloons uh, to, to uh, collect money. The question is like, well, maybe I'm a risk taker in video games. Maybe I'm a total daredevil in video games. But does it actually show that I'm prone to taking risks in the real world? That's a question. And then also is risk taking actually something that you need in the job or do your accountants just happen to be all risk takers and, but they don't have to take risks in the job. And that's something, you know, if, a, if, if, uh, if an AI would look at, uh, you know, a facial expression, our hair color, they probably, probably would infer that a lot of people with brown hair be successful in the job because statistically there are more people with brown hair than blonde hair in the world. But we obviously know that not, none of that has anything to do with how qualified we are. Um, and unfortunately, machines do not know that. They just make statistical inferences uh, based on the training data. And if you have, you know, maybe more men in the training data because you've hired more men in the past, we've seen in some of these resume screeners that they start uh, preferring men because they start finding uh, words that uh, more often are associated with men on resumes. So, you know, found uh, folks, employment lawyers who looked at these tools and 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 one of them found that uh, uh, folks who put the word baseball, the job had nothing to do with baseball, <laughs> uh, baseball on their resume got more points and folks who put uh, the word uh, softball uh, on their resume get, get fewer points. And obviously in the United States, more women play softball or are interested in softball, more men play baseball and are probably interested in baseball. Um, and so you might have uh, gender discrimination through the back door, right? You think this is like, well, just the words that people put on the on on the resume, but people don't realize that there's actual like those words come with like a lot of background information. Tell us more about like who you are as a person, but not about the traits and your job skills that you really should be using to um, make hiring decisions. Um, so we see a, a lot of problematic things and the bias that we have in the human world. We often just transfer it into these tools. Plus we bring in like, you know, um, um, some machine bias, right? That one of the tools figured out that Thomas is a, is a signifier of success for, for resume screens, probably because there were a bunch of Thomases in the, you know, in the resumes of people who were deemed successful at the company. Any human would know, well, I mean, sorry to all the Thomases out there, but your name doesn't qualify you for anything. Your skills and, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, like your, your work experience qualifies you, but the machine doesn't know that. Um, they're not thinking machines. So yeah, we, I, you know, everywhere I looked, uh, you know, first I was like, kind of like, woo, maybe, maybe there's like in, in really fascinating solutions here. And the more I looked, I was like, oh yeah, I don't think that we shouldn't be using that. Oh no, we shouldn't be using that. Um, and then I did some tools. I tested some of the tools myself because, you know, I was just interested. I was like, oh, I wonder, you know, let me test it. Let me try it. Um, so one of the things that I tested is called Curious Thing AI, 
it's marketed to um, companies in, uh, you know, mostly in the English speaking world in the West to hire folks overseas for, for call centers. And one of the things that, you know, a lot of companies in the US care about, if you call their customer service line, that the person speaks English. So this AI tool set out to find out um, how good um, uh, candidates speak English. Um, so I did it, uh, answered all the questions, um, and I spoke English, and I got an 8.5 out of 9 English competent. I was very proud because English is my second language. And I was like, ah, this AI tool C and recognized, um, you know, that my, my, my English skills are wonderful. And then I thought, well, you know, let's test it a little bit. What is if I do, if there's silence, would I still get, um, uh, uh, you know, some sort of results? Um, because all the vendors, when I asked them, like, well, what is with people with accents? What if people who speak dialects? What if people who have a speech impairment, what if they use these tools? Are they being um, uh, treat it fairly, uh, and do the, can, can the tools quote unquote understand what they're actually saying? Yes, of course. Yes. And all the companies to, uh, have always told me they need to, um, hit a certain threshold. And if they get underneath that, a, a, a tool would actually alert like a hiring manager to provide an accommodation, maybe an in-person interview. Um, so I was like, okay, well, let's speak to it in German. It's my first language. Let's just try. It's just probably going to get a mistake. Um, so I spoke to it in German and I didn't even say anything relevant to the job. I just read the Wikipedia entry on psychometrics in German um, every time I was prompted to answer. Uh, so I thought I would for sure get a mistake, uh, an error. Um, but I got an email that said I was um, scored six out of nine English competent. I was like, wow, I didn't even say a word in English and I got scored competent. So there's a bunch of tools that I did like sort of similar uh, things um, with one of the tools, my interview, um, it actually um, made a transcript of the words that I spoke in English, uh, in German, uh, desperately trying to make sense in English, just total gibberish, um, but I still get a 73% match for the job. And I was told it's because my intonation was apparently so convincing to the tool that I was 73% qualified for the job. Um, so I always tell that to people like, I can code, I can like build these machines, um, but if I can break them so easily and very clearly they don't work, we have a whole lot of problems here. Yeah, I know, I love that anecdote. Like in the, uh, in the book, the, um, the German that you were reading the gibberish English that was uh, that the transcript came up with it, it like there was something like sociology does it iron I know it's and my like, favorite <laughs> nematode da, da, da. that was like I don't even yeah. know what those words mean in English to be honest like they, they clearly don't form any meaningful sentences um but you exactly. know the developers told me that the tool would totally disregard it because it's gibberish um so it would just go to the intonation of, of, of my voice and that apparently was so convincing but the problem is there's actually no science that intonation right. of our voices in job interviews are actually meaningful to predict if we are going to be successful in the job. It's just something, you know, we see this a whole lot in, in the world of AI. It's like we see a lot of signals that we can track, right? We can track all the keyboard, we can track all of the websites that I visit, the programs that I that I use on my computer. But is it actually a meaningful um uh, prediction if I'm successful or not, I doubt that because a lot of people are successful in very different ways. Um, and you know, my job also entails a lot of phone calls. So when I use some of the, the the tracking software myself, I was very unproductive parts of the day when I was like, no, it was really productive because I was on the phone or I was like outlining an article. Um, and I don't do that on my computer, but obviously because the computer can't track it, uh, it doesn't exist. It's unproductive. Um, so, you know, a lot of these things are very basic inferences, um, but nonetheless can be very harmful. That's sort of the problem, right? Like even when companies know, uh, you know, it might be problematic, they still want a technological solution. Um, mm -hmm. And they also don't tell us if something didn't work out, right? Like a lot of companies become very hesitant because actually Amazon, it's one of the companies that talked about it, that their resume screener went rogue and started to downgrade a lot of women. So it started to, you know, it inferred from the resumes of people who have been successful at the companies that the word woman or women um, is actually a predictor uh, of not being successful at Amazon. So people who had those words on their resume were, were downgraded. Um, so obviously that was like, you know, uh, probably led to uh, a lot of gender discrimination. They said this was just a pilot. We never used it for hiring decisions, but they couldn't fix the tool. Um, so also that tells us maybe if a, if a large gigantic tech corporation cannot fix these tools, maybe there isn't something that can be fixed and that this should be used. Um, so, but I think, 
Amazon got a lot of flack and I think a lot of companies are now wary to talk about this when they use the tool and it's been unsuccessful because they're afraid that somebody's going to sue them. They have a massive class action lawsuit. If they say, well, we used this for two years, it didn't work. Um, there could be thousands, hundreds of thousands um, of people who have been harmed um, that have a claim against them. So we don't have a lot of transparency. And I think that's sort of unfair. And that is coupled with like, um, you know, we, 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 we um, apply a lot to a lot of jobs, right? And I get routinely get rejected for whatever reason, right? And I as an applicant wouldn't know, do I get rejected because I'm not qualified? That's what I assume. Um, but I wouldn't know if it's a faulty algorithm, right? So it's actually kind right. of hard any legal uh, action in the case because um, if I want to uh, sue a company I have to have evidence of wrongdoing well I don't really have evidence um, in fact I, I have no evidence I don't even know why I was uh, rejected or was pushed into the next round so there isn't a whole lot of transparency here right right and there's so many things um, you know to to talk about in uh, with everything that you've mentioned I want to say yeah when it comes to Amazon it it does seem like they in some way deserve credit for coming, you know, coming forward and being public about what happened uh, with the tool that they tried to build and couldn't get to work. Um, because yeah, how many companies now use it and don't come forward for fear of, of any kind of uh, PR backlash. Uh, and then, you know, also how many companies go ahead and use the tool even though it does discriminate yeah. um, and, and yeah. they're not able to fix the bias and oh well if it's uh if it's more efficient and saves time they might go ahead and do it anyway yeah and um, you know and and, and and on the face of it the tool works right it's like it's it's not yeah. on my phone either my phone makes phone calls or it doesn't and i know it's broken or not but like the tool still ranks people it still takes yeah. in thousands of applications and ranks people and you know if I, and even when i made all these tests and i knew they were like not based on science like when i get the score i was like oh, well, maybe I am, you know, that right. qualified or not. I mean, it's really hard to ignore sort of the the, the science or the math of the numbers. Mm -hmm. And it is kind of compelling. Um, so the tool still ranks and sorts people. Um, so if you don't take a closer look, it looks like it works. Um, right. So I think that's sort of the problem. If you don't investigate, if you don't look closer, the problem is like a lot of companies buy these tools because they want to save money and make this more efficient. They don't want to hire more people to now monitor their AI tools for hiring, right? That's like sort of mm -hmm. counter. And, you know, the, the the vendors have a really good story to tell. They have these technical reports that are, you know, pages of pages of like uh, academic studies and how they validated the tools. And I mean, it's actually hard for me to understand, let alone, yeah. um, you know, folks, I don't even, I don't have a PhD, but others don't either. And um, so you're just like, oh, sounds like they really thought about this. Um, and we don't have a whole lot of transparency. So it's not like when one company uses a tool, it doesn't work, this gets put in the public record. And then another company might actually be like, whoa, wait, like if this company didn't work for them, why should we use it? We don't actually know that. So I think that's one of right. the big problems. Right. And you have this, you know, this key question of relevance, like it is sorting and making these, um, you know, rankings and, and giving some kind of uh, numerical quality to different candidates. But what how relevant is the information? Um, that's, yeah, we have that's a, whole, a whole lot of validity. Like, is it actually yeah. picking up on the uh, uh, on the on the things that are uh, predictive of success in the job or is it just picking right. up on something? So, you know, a lot of people that I've talked to were like, yeah, these are like elaborate number generators. And those are actually fair. Um, in a weird way, because they treat everyone the same way. It may not feel fair to us because I'm sorted out because I'm number three um, in, 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 in the Excel sheet, but technically they're very fair. But uh, companies don't have to pay money for that. That would be an easy uh, fix uh, to just hire people uh, by you know sort of sorting half people in that bucket and the other one in the other bucket. Uh, but but we don't want to do that. Um, so I think there is, uh, you know, just this, this like, um, trust of technology and making it more efficient that people just don't take a closer look. And it looks like it works. And maybe the candidates seem fine that come through. I mean, on the other hand, we do have a lot of companies that complain about not having <laughs> uh, a qualified people, right? So and um, so we, we, we know from Joe Fuller at Harvard who looked at this, we're like, wait, how is this possible? Like we have so many people who apply who complain like, wait, I have a computer science degree. Why does it take me 200 uh, applications to get a job when everyone in uh, in the tech industry is like complaining that they're not enough talent. And so the problem is often that like, we don't know how to hire. So we write this like long, and I'm sure you've all seen it. I've come across these like super long as job description, pardon my language, with like so many skills that are being asked, so many qualifications. And so if a tool is calibrated to look for all of that in a candidate, how many are going to make it through? And maybe all of them 
are mediocre in a lot of skills, but actually there's a lot of people who have five, the best five skills um, that I get sorted out. And some of the filters, uh, you know, when Joe Fuller surveyed company leaders, um, he found out that about half of them have AI tools that are calibrated to, to sort out people who have uh, six months or longer uh, work break. So you can be the most qualified candidate if you have a, uh, uh, if you have a gap in your resume, you get sorted out by these tools. And you know that really calls into question, is this fair um, in, in, in hiring to do something like that? Yeah, and I also think it's interesting to to look at that that question of of how are qualified candidates getting um, filtered out if a human being is supposed to be involved in that decision. You know, if the vendors are telling you, oh no, it's okay, because there's going to be somebody who actually makes that decision. The tool's not making the decision. It's just helping a human being make the decision. So how does yes. that end up ha happening? Yes. So that's what vendors tell us. And they've always told me that. And and I sometimes feel like, wow, is this like so weird because I thought they're buying these tools to make technical decisions for them so they don't have to make the decisions themselves like if I have 2,000 resumes and I use a tool to like you know get me the 10 best like I'm not going to look through all of the 2,000 resumes because why why would I actually then spend money on this tool if I have to do the work myself um so then I did come across um you know Curious Thing AI and their HR talk actually they talked about they're like well technically you can look at you know you can listen to every every um uh, uh, every call that people have, but why would you? Here's your results. Look, look at this. This is the efficiency that we provide. And I was like, oh, finally, somebody's saying it in sort of an industry only, right? Like I'm the only reporter. I don't, you know, they kindly let me go. They, you know, they usually in HR tech conference, everyone assumes they're amongst each other and there really aren't a lot of reporters. Um, so, you know, they're very candid about this. Um, and I also found out I filed a Freedom of information requests between Higher View and Atlanta Public Schools, um, who um, had a pilot program looking at using um, AI hiring uh, for teachers to use the AI on, on, on the video interviews. And in it, actually, Higher View in one of the emails said they're going to install a cut score at 33%. So, whoever um, scores less than 33% would be automatically rejected. Um, so we actually do have proof that companies use it that in, in that way. They just don't want to publicly uh, maybe admit to this because there's so much backlash um, against AI now um, that they feel like this would be re re um, rep reputational harm. But actually, cut scores are pretty regular in assessments because otherwise, if 100% of the people go through the tool, why am I using the What's tool the if they all get to the next pile, the next part, part in the round, right? Like they are cut mm -hmm. of scores. Um, so we see this again and again. And I also had a uh, Martin Birch in, 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 uh, in, well, he was based in Spain and was, was applying to a job in the United Kingdom. Um, he also was automatically rejected. And actually he forced the company in, in disclosure uh, to, uh, to actually say that. So there was like proof that this is actually happening. Um, it's just not the companies aren't so, uh, um, forthcoming about that knowledge. Right. Um, and I want to briefly talk about the legality aspect of this, mm. especially with regards to, you know, individuals with disabilities. Yeah. Um, is it possible that these tools are illegally discriminating against people in a protected class? Yes, it could be. Uh, we, we don't have a whole lot of evidence, right? Because no one is looking closely. What we see is like, um, and you know, there's a little bit in the weeds, but but hear me out for a second. So the Equal Employment the Opportunity Commission, who is, you know, one of the regulators of the world of work in, in the US, has this like sort of rule of thumb, it's called four-fifth rule, that that uh, men and women and people of different races sort of go through the through these assessment tools, which would also be AI tools that, that you know, um, uh, and, and for how qualified we are for a job at roughly the, uh, the same rate. So if 100% men get through, 80% uh, of the female applicants also have to go through and they, they look at that. But no one looks for people with disabilities. Um, so that's, we wouldn't even know how they get through the tool at similar or different rates. Um, and then we also know that like, um, uh, uh, you know, most of the time disabilities present very individually. So, so maybe I'm autistic. Um, but somebody else who's also autistic, they, their uh, disability may present so much so differently so that a, that a tool that looks for statistical, uh, 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 meaningful statistical relevant data wouldn't pick that up. 
Um, we also know that often, you know, people who um, who have a disability, also women and people of color, right? They're underrepresented in the workforce for a long time because human hiring managers have discriminated against them and have underestimated them, right? So the problem is we also don't have folks uh, with uh, uh, with disabilities uh, currently in the workforce representing like how many how many folks are actually in the in, in the larger population so they're often not in the training data even if they were in the training data their uh, uh, dis, uh, disabilities are so in in individually presenting that they probably wouldn't be picked up and that's like a round in a, in a, that we try to press in a square that it just doesn't really work how can a statistical inference tool uh, find people um, in such an individual spectrum. Um, and then also like some of these tools, right? Like the idea of like one size fits all sounds very compelling, right? Everyone will be judged the same way by a computer. It sounds fair, uh, but 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 the truth is, you know, when I, when I played one of the AI games with somebody who, who has a disability, like he was really concerned for, for one of the games, I had to hit the space bar as fast as I can. It's called hard task and easy task. Um, and, uh, you know, the question is that a lot of, I think, applicants ask themselves playing the game is also like, what does that have to do with the job? I've never had to hit the space bar as fast as I had to in, for, for a job. What is that actually testing? Um, well, it's supposed to test, like, I think, um, how fast we make decisions and how fast our brain works. But like somebody who has a motor disability actually maybe couldn't hit the space bar as fast as possible. Um, but maybe they could do the job. We just don't know what the job is, right? And what the job entails. And legally under the American with Disabilities Act, they are um, entitled to have an, an accommodation. And also if they can do the job uh, with reasonable accommodation, um, they need to be, uh, you know, considered. But the question is like, you know, if I start playing a game, if I have a disability, first of all, people with disabilities often don't want to tell potential employees that they have a disability and need accommodation because they're afraid they're gonna land on some sort of imaginary pile B that no one ever looks at, right? Um, but the problem is with some of these tools is like, you don't even know that you're being subjected to the tool. And when you start a game, what do you know what they're gonna ask you to do, right? Like, would you know that you have to press the the the, the space bar as fast as possible? No, you wouldn't. Um, so we see all of these tech tools are built by people um, that maybe don't have the disability, don't have people in mind with disabilities or people with accents or, you know, people who are maybe not part of the statistical uh, uh, middle. Um, and that then leads to all of these problems. So I do think that like mm -hmm. there is potentially a legal case to be made on many legal cases. And I think what was actually also shocking to me, I talked to uh, a few vocational counselors who try to work with people with disabilities and try to get them into the workforce. And they said, Legally, people with disabilities are entitled to a reasonable accommodation, which maybe in a instead of a video interview would be an interview with uh, with a human, for example. And they said every time they asked for accommodation, they didn't get. So the system is already broken. But now mm -hmm. we put in AI screens that then also make it harder for folks to actually get a human to help them with an accommodation, or even a human maybe to explain who they are, how they may be um, uh, different, and what accommodations they need. But everything is so full of AI screens and, and tech screens that we don't actually get to a human to make our case. And I think that's especially a concern for folks with disabilities and, and, and other people who have accents, who speak, who speak dialects, right? Like do these tools that transcribe our words, do they actually do this fairly for everyone? There's lots of questions here. Right, right. And it, and it brings up this question of like, what's the impact of that information asymmetry that you've talked about of like, yeah. you know, we, we have, no real idea what uh, to the being extent that these tools us, are yeah. being used, like what when are they being used and, and in what ways. And on the other side of the equation, employers who utilize these tools really have a lot of information about us, although it may be completely irrelevant information, but it's still personal. Um, and it still might it still might be used, right? We see this like yeah. total imbalance. I mean, look, hiring was always a power imbalance, right? Because employers always made the decisions and they rejected a lot of people. Uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago when we even wrote uh, uh, cover letters. Um, but now it feels like it's just like overwhelming, um, this this power asymmetry. And I think that's why people maybe now feel a little bit like Gen, Gen AI is helping them a little bit as applicants. So we see a little bit that like um, for some maybe um, uh, uh, savvy folks, they use ChatGPT or other AI tools or Gen AI tools to uh, write their cover letters, uh, you know, polish their resumes or write their resumes. They use it to um, sort of ask questions about like, what are the most likely questions in job interviews? What are the most likely answers? 
Um, you know, I've seen some, and I think this is very rare, but like, uh, you know, doing one way video interviews because you get a, you know, the uh, pre, you get a pre recorded question, maybe you get three minutes till you have to say the answer. They use ChatGPT to come up with the answer. Um, it really, you know, thoroughly uh, nice answer. And like, you know, how do you show when your team uh, uh, propensity, you know, whatever. Um, so we've seen that. And we've actually also seen a couple of times and, and the FBI put out a, a note to employers saying like, hey, there's people um, uh, using other people to do the test for them. They yeah. AI screens and, you know, companies don't notice. Uh, there's also folks who use um, sort of, and I've certainly used deep fakes um, in some of my tests where I deep fake my voice, it turns out. Um, my deep fake is better than myself. It was two percentage point higher uh, than myself. Maybe it doesn't have such a thick accent than I do, but uh, who knows? But, uh, you know, no one was in, in front of the camera and I had just um, uh, written everything down and used, uh, used, used the deep fake to give the answers and the tool um, uh, um, suggested that I would be, I think like, 70% or 78% or so um, successful in the job, a match for the job, even though there was no one in front of the camera and I deep faked my voice. So there's no human actually doing something. So companies don't necessarily find that. And there's a real threat, I think also for like insider hacks because you know you work remotely, you get all the company's information the first day um, and there's no whole lot of security built in. Like, in fact, there isn't even security built in that there was a human being moving, which is I think pretty standard now, even in facial recognition uh, tools. Um, so th there's a whole lot of security also we need to worry about. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago, the Hacker Collective um, hacked into, uh, you know, a chatbot database that, that companies used to hire, especially very large companies. And they were able to reject really nilly people and found their personal information. So, I mean, this is like highly sensitive. Some of this stuff is for highly sensitive, right? Like my facial expression analysis, like I don't want this to be on the internet. Um, uh, I don't even know if I want it, but I talk a lot about like, I feel like, a lot of these tools force us into consumerism. Like, if you want the job, are you going to say no to the to the uh, one way video interview? You no, know, you're probably going to do it. So we are forced consumers if we want to or not. We don't know how the tool works, um, and you know that that doesn't seem a whole lot of fair. Yeah, yeah. And you have in the appendix, you give a whole slew of tips for job seekers. Uh, I would recommend everyone check that out. Um, so yes, I have the... some on my LinkedIn too. So I think, these oh, are, you know, and I can't like, you know, and I have to say a little bit like, I can't, I don't know exactly how every AI tool for every company is calibrated, right? None of that know that. In fact, probably the developers and the companies don't know themselves, but they're just general things that, that we've learned that might really be helpful uh, when you as a job seeker encounter some of these tools. And there, there's actually yeah. also some AI tools that may help you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's always a cat and mouse game, right? We see that also right. with surveillance at work. They call this now um, productivity theater. Um, mm -hmm. That companies yeah. now want to find out when you like check in at Slack in the morning and then maybe you go for a walk and um, you're not actually spending productive time, but you're spending a lot of time making it seem like you are productive. I mean, human beings yeah. are very smart when they recognize, oh, I'm being watched and um, uh, maybe I'll make it look like. I'm very productive, um, but is that really the intention of companies that they want their, you know, in one of the Microsoft reports, they found out that a lot of people spend an hour a day on productivity theater, not doing actual productive work. So mm -hmm. the question is like, why are we using these tools if we know right. they lead it's, to these it's incentivizing. Yeah, it's yeah. incentivizing people to like be working toward these metrics instead of actually being Yeah, productive. and I think we see that a lot, right? Like this like love of technology, but at mm -hmm. the same time, you know, company leaders say like, oh, I need agile creative employees. But then I also want to use these tools because they are right there and they can track people. Well, I mean, I don't think you're going to find a whole lot of creative employees if you use some of these AI tools because they look for the statistical mean and like outliers, right. be they're creative or not or whatever, uh, makes them special. They're going to fall outside of the of the quote unquote norm that these uh, tools establish. So you're not going to find those right. people if you want them. So they, there's a whole lot of things where I feel like we haven't really spent a lot of thoughts here uh, yeah. in depth. And Hilke, you bring up a really interesting point too, because at All Tech as Human, one of the main things we try to do is diversify the tech industry. Um, and how do you diversify an industry, whether it's tech or anywhere else, if if you are uh, using data that's really just trying to, to get toward uh, similarities with people who've previously been successful in the role, um, you know, it's amplifying those similarities and whether you're looking for diversity of backgrounds or diversity yeah. of uh, different disciplines, bringing a different perspective to the table. Um, it, it becomes harder and harder if these tools are in use. Um, yeah, across all of yeah. These I mean, if you have companies. a completely div diverse company, 
you probably might have hired diverse talent with these tools, but you know, it turns out that like most companies don't, are not diverse. In fact, the right. overwhelming amount are not. So if you use historical data of your own biased hiring, you're going to replicate those uh, those biases. And the problem is here, you might replicate them at scale, right? Like, and I feel bad for somebody who had a, a biased human hiring manager who sorted them out, but they can only do so much harm, right? Like the scale uh, and the scope of these tools are just unprecedented. If you use a faulty tool, on 3 million people that apply to your company a year and you sort out an overwhelming amount um, of women, like you have discriminated maybe against hundreds of thousands of, of, of women. And that is, the scope is just wild here. Yeah. All right, so we are coming to the end of our time together, Hilka. So I do wanna pull up uh, this question from someone viewing the live stream right now, June Christian. Uh, asks, um, well, says, I'm loving the conversation so far. Thank you. June from Missouri. I'm curious about how facial recognition software may read expressions on various skin tones and if phenotype is scored according to the biases of the programmer. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've definitely seen this uh, this this problem uh, famously in, in, in Joy uh, Bul uh, Bulamini's um, gender shades, right? That like uh, Black women had a much, much lower um, accuracy score than uh, even white women or, 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 or compared to white men. So here is like the, the tools look at facial expressions. Um, so look at like, like how much are your, like your mouth is up and that uh, indicates that you're happy because you're smiling. I mean, it also turns out I sometimes smile even though I'm nervous in job interviews and I'm actually not happy. So the inferences are kind of off too here. Um, and uh, we've seen a little bit, um, there is uh, one researcher at the University of Maryland, and she has looked at uh, uh, photos of base basketball players in these facial expression tools and found out that um, often Af African-American, although they have the same uh, sort of very similar uh, 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 facial movements, they get a, a, a much higher inference for um, like furrowed brows and looking angry versus looking happy on, on white players. So there, there might be a racial dis discrepancy here. I mean, the one good news in, 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 in this world is though that like luckily higher view, um, you know, I reported on this in the Wall Street Journal, Drew Harville reported on this in the Washington Post. There was like sort of a, a government complaint from a, a watchdog. And I think there was so much um, a pushback against this facial expression analysis and intonation of voice analysis that how have you actually abandoned it? And um, they're not using it anymore. So that's the, like, there is some little progress happening. What happens a lot, unfortunately, then there's like other companies that then, you know, they still feel like, oh, we have a problem with hiring. Oh, there's facial expression analysis. Why, why don't we try that? Uh, not knowing there's this whole body of already proven that this doesn't work. So it's a little bit like a whack-a-mole. The good thing is though that HireVue is the lar one of the largest uh, companies in the space. So uh, thank God they abandoned that. Um, there's still a lot of things we need to do and, and how we need to be skeptical and, and study these companies and, and, and these tools. But sometimes public opinion does move the needle a little bit. So I, mm -hmm. I, was, I was like, oh, this does work a little bit. Um, so this is, this is work that does make a difference even though sometimes yeah. it feels like very sh small progress. Right. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. I have many more questions for you. And actually, anyone who is interested in digging more into this, please do pick up the book. It uh, also goes into some potential solutions. There are uh, quite a I few. I have some that, ideas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> very good ones. Too. So, um, so everyone, please take a look at that. And uh, yeah, thank you, Hilka, so much for joining me today for the conversation. And thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, and oh, you can also find... Like, find me on LinkedIn. Like I have a lot of tips that I share from the book. And I, I love to in, in, uh, in engage with folks. Like I'm so incredibly grateful for people who have emailed me that they read the book. It's, a, it's really amazing. So, so thank you all. I'm happy to engage and, and discuss and, and think, think about solutions. Um, Great. You know, it's, it's, uh, it, the subject has not uh, uh, let up. Yeah, I've been so fascinated by it for six years and I'm, I still am. Like it doesn't, it keeps on, it keeps on giving and just be it's so interesting the ways we find ways to quantify human beings. Yes. And if you want to uh, check out this video again, we're going to have it on our YouTube page uh, for All Tech is Human and then check us out at alltechishuman.org. So thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.